I'm Will Anderson. I'm Instruments of Time and Truth's general manager and the editor for this web series. This series has three main aims. The first of which is to shed a light onto little-known aspects of the musical culture of the period in which IT&T specialises. The second is simply to share some music with you. And the third is to provide support for our artists at this immensely difficult time for the arts industry. I hope that this series, and this episode in particular, illuminates how, in a way, musicians have always been at the mercy of the tides of history. Shifting patterns of commercial and political power have brought musicians and their instruments across class boundaries and national borders. Changing ideas about those boundaries have created new fashions and dismissed or reinvented old ones. Changing production technologies, architecture and performance contexts have shaped the sound worlds that have been possible and desirable. Professional musicians occupied a liminal space between high society and the servant class, often performing to great acclaim and great financial reward, but held at an unbridgeable remove from their rich patrons. Because of their problematic status both in their own time and in the 19th century composer-oriented narratives that still pervade our musical historiography today, the stories of the original performers of the music of the Baroque period often go unheard. So I hope you enjoy this collection of the histories of wind players and their instruments during the 18th century. We start with a performance by flautist Jonathan Slade. My name is Jonathan Slade and I play the flute with Instruments of Time and Truth. I thought that the extract that I just played would be a particularly appropriate way to start this short presentation, as it is in fact an aria from Handel's Oratorio, The Triumph of Time and Truth, from which our ensemble gets its name. Now you might think it's slightly unusual for a solo flute player to play a soprano aria, which is supposed to be accompanied from a major oratorio. But actually, it's pretty typical of what was going on in England in the 18th century. That's because the flute occupied a special status among instruments during that time. To introduce that concept, I've got a slide which I'm going to show you now. Believe it or not, that is a walking stick flute. Now, the fact that the market for such an item apparently no longer exists is a matter of enormous personal disappointment, but the fact that it existed at the time should tell us something about the role of the flute in 18th century England. For the most part, it wasn't considered a professional instrument. It featured very rarely in the most popular works of the time, such as the Handel operas. However, for the gentleman amateur, and it always was a gentleman by the way, flutes and other wind instruments were considered wildly inappropriate for young ladies. For the gentleman amateur, it was ideal. It was portable and much easier to get a half-decent sound out of than, say, a violin. Its portability arguably contributed to its presence on board ships and in other parts of the empire, such as India, where music making was being strongly encouraged. There are a couple of interesting artistic examples of gentlemen and their flutes uh, a couple here I'm going to show you by the artist Thomas Gainsborough, himself an amateur musician. Um, the first one is of Peter Darnell Muleman, Charles Crockett and William Keeble in a countryside setting. 
And then this one of Sir William Wollaston, who was actually an MP, with the flute to one side to denote his wide range of talents and interests. So to return for a moment to the opening extract I played from The Triumph of Time and Truth, I actually stumbled across this in a gentleman's pocket companion to the flute. These were produced very regularly by London-based publishers eager to capitalise on the musical tastes and aspirations of these gentlemen amateur flute players. They typically comprise a tutor for the flute, so a brief guide to technique, usually translated from the French, who were arguably the experts in this at the time. And then this would be followed by a musical appendix, a real mishmash of famous folk tunes peppered with Handel opera arias, which are really popular at the time. Um, so in terms of the folk tunes, we've got some real timeless classics in here, such as What a Bow My Granny Was, The Dutch Fishmonger, and Sir, You Are a Comical Fellow. And to give you some, well, to play some examples for you, by the way, for various reasons, I'm having to play on a French instrument at the moment, so apologies for the anachronism. This is how things usually started. You'll definitely recognise this tune, but you may not recognise the trill. And then I found this one as well in one of the other pocket companions, the Baroque origins of which are often overlooked. And I also thought it might be fun to play a couple of the handle extracts which appear. These appear in a pocket companion published by John Johnson, I would estimate in the late 1730s, judging by the musical extracts included. We've got a march from Handel's wildly popular Rinaldo, followed immediately from a chorus from Atalanta. Before I finish, I just wanted to play you a short air or aria by the extraordinary campaigner, writer and composer Ignatius Sancho, perhaps one of the most prominent black figures of 18th century London, and this was part of a collection published in 1779. Before I do, I wanted to acknowledge the tremendous contributions of Robert Mealy and Nicholas McGeegan, who've helped me enormously with this project, so I'm very grateful to them indeed. Um, I hope you enjoy this final extract and have enjoyed this little snapshot into the role of the flute in the 18th century in England. <laughs>
was an overture by Philidor, whose family together with the Hotteters wasted much good wood in producing the oboe, or oboe as we now call it. I'm Mark Bajant, one of the principal oboes with Instruments of Time and Truth, and I'm here today to talk to you about the oboe and its role in 18th century London. Although some female and amateur players existed, the oboe was mostly taken up by male professional instrumentalists, and not the gentleman amateurs associated with the flute. This was not due to cost, for Morris recalls that in England in 1688, a hoboy with ivory points and tipped with the same cost one pound seven shillings, whilst in 1697, four reeds were two shillings. But rather, the peculiarities of the reed and the techniques to play them required a more dedicated and time-consuming commitment to attain any reliability. Developed in France during the second half of the 18th century at the request of Lully, who wanted his Renaissance shawms tamed to play indoors with and at the same pitch as the new violins, the new aubois was described by the Englishman John Bannister in 1695 as sounding not much inferior to the trumpet, but with a good reed, as easy and soft as the flute. Attributes that lent it to military use, theatrical and solo. Fashionable throughout Europe, many important palaces employed bands of oboes who, outside their military roles, performed for a variety of functions, both social and more formal. Princess Anne established an oboe band of six players at the English court, which lasted into the reign of George I. They played the famous Queen's Farewell at Queen Mary's funeral, and it's likely were involved in the performance of Handel's water music, premiered in 1717. Introduced to London in 1673 by Robert Cambert, the English public liked the new French instrument despite the prevailing anti-French sentiment of the day, and its players were quickly adopted into the London theatres. Cambert, one of the first French composers to adopt the oboe into the orchestra in France, was sent to England by Louis XIV to become maître de musique to Charles II's mistress, a young Breton noblewoman, the Duchess of Portsmouth in order to try and keep French influence at court, and in doing so he instigated its arrival, for with him came James Paisible, de Bresma, Guiton and Boutet to perform the oboe parts of his operas. Whilst British players took up and performed on the oboe, itinerant European musicians were the most esteemed players. This was true with few exceptions for the next two centuries. Many of these players settled permanently in London or visited for extended periods. Some came for shorter tours to show off their skills to a paying public in a competitive market eager for novelty, spectacle and virtuosity. At the start of the 18th century, French music was very much in vogue, so I'm going to play a piece by the Flemish oboist Jean-Baptiste Loyer to give a flavour of the French style. <laughs> 
Gradually, the Italian style took over from the French, and Handel played his part in establishing its dominance following the success of his opera Rinaldo in 1711, which we heard about in the first episode. At this time, Johann Ernst Galliard, for whom Handel wrote sonatas and many solos in his early operas, was one of London's foremost players. By no means the first Italian oboist to settle in England, Giuseppe Sammartini certainly turned heads. Sir John Hawkins describing him in his General History of the Science and Practice of Music, published in 1776, wrote, Sammartini is undoubtedly the greatest oboist that the world has ever known. Before his time, the tone of the instrument was rank, and in the hands of the ablest proficients, harsh and grating to the ear. But by some great study and application, by some peculiar management of the reed, he contrived to produce such a tone as approached the nearest to that of the human voice of any we know of. His singing style is shown beautifully in this extract from his sonata in G minor. Sammartini taught the English oboist and composer Thomas Vincent, who became an important figure after Sammartini's death. He wrote in a similar gallant style as can be heard in this movement from his sonata in A minor. <laughs> 
The second half of the 18th century saw many changes in musical style, and in fact the oboe itself, which developed into the instrument we now call the classical oboe, with its narrower bore and higher pitch, of which Johann Christoph Fischer was one of Europe's leading exponents. Fischer settled in London in 1768, where he was first recorded as working as a member of the largely German band of George III's German Queen, Queen Charlotte. He taught the next generation of players and worked regularly with Carl Friedrich Arbel and J.C. Bach, who featured earlier in this series. Fischer is well known for composing one of the most famous melodies of the day, the rondo from his oboe concerto in C, which was so well known that Mozart wrote a set of 12 variations on it for piano. I would like to finish by performing the theme on the classical oboe. My name is Emily White and I play trombone for Instruments of Time and Truth. I'm also a member of the English Cornet and Sackbad Ensemble and I play principal trombone with Il Giardino a Monaco. I also teach down at the Royal Welsh College of Music and Drama and I'm Professor of Sackbad at the Guildhall School of Music and Drama. Sackbad is one of the names used in England for the trombone when it was first invented around the late 1400s. After its recovery from near oblivion, the Italian term trombone was used, and today we tend to use the word sackbut referring to the early versions of the trombone. As you see here, they're very much the modern trombone and the sackbut, copied from a 17th century historical model, are very much the same instrument with just a few minor developments. In this video, I will be talking about the trombone in the 18th century in England and its fall from its place of nobility and virtuosity where it had been for 250 years into almost total obscurity. The climb back from that has been long and some people would say it's still ongoing. It was an expensive instrument of great dignity and its main home was the church. Major cathedrals, sacred music, and used at ceremonial and major public events. Because it can imitate the human voice, play very quietly and loud, and outdoor and indoor, it was used in chamber music and also very large scale musical events. Almost all other instruments at this time were limited to one or two characteristics. It was very costly to make a sackbut. There were no known makers in the British Isles until after the 18th century and one of the reasons for its extremely high cost was the technology to make a perfectly parallel double slide. All instruments were imported from Germany, generally Nuremberg, and around the time of Henry VIII he, he had eight permanent salaried trombones on his staff. And the price of instruments could be equated to that of owning an aircraft. Often courts and cathedrals would own the instruments and hire the players. The trumpet and the horn at this time were very much more simple, simply a tube bent, so that meant that their cost was much less than the trombone. The trombone or sackbut was a professional's instrument. As playing the trombone distorts the face, as you can see, it was discouraged for aristocracy to engage with this instrument and its cost prevented it being used widely by um, poorer people or itinerant musicians. So it was a small group of specialised professionals who played it, but because they were used at all these public events, they were widely heard by the general population. However, this small group of professionals quickly vanished when their services were no longer required.
Composers in the 15th and 16th century didn't tend to specify instruments. Um, however, by the 17th century, we start to find sonatas that are specifying trombone. And the repertoire nominated for this instrument shows that the virtuosity and the musical expression that was expected from the players. Scores such as the Sonata No. 9 by Weckmann show the trombone equal to the violin, bassoon and cornetino. And it was given this beautiful expressive opening phrase, which I'm going to play to you now. The facsimile here of Dario Costello's Sonata Quinta shows him asking for sopran, which means any treble instrument such as recorder, cornetto, violin and trombone. I'm going to play the opening phrase of this terrific little sonata and you can see from the first page that there is no holding back on the fast notes or the expressive phrases in this example of writing for the trombone in the 17th century. And then a little short extract from the solo passage in the middle. After the monarchy was restored in 1660, musical taste changed and King Charles wanted a new style. He was enamoured of France and the 24 violins that he hired in England were to copy and emulate the 24 violins in France. Even though Matthew Locke had written his music for His Majesty's sagbuts and cornets in that year, it was too late to save the solemn sound of cornets and sackbuts. The stately voice of the trombone that had been around for so long before was out of fashion and it was not what he was looking for. The bassoon replaced the role that the trombone could have had in the court and a mistranslation of the word sambuca in the Bible perpetuated for many years, many hundreds of years in fact, that implied that the sackbut was from the time of King David helped to link the trombone with the ancient and the sacred. Canterbury Cathedral has records of players re-employed after King Charles came back, but they didn't last long and the last payment record was 1670. By, 18, by 1682, uh, the places were advertised in their books as four places vacant, which were supplied formerly by the Sackbuts and Cornets. And there's no record of them ever being filled after that. And a hundred years later, 1752, um, the unused sackbuts were listed in an inventory in the, in the Canterbury Cathedral. It seems possible that there's no one around in England at the time who would have known how to even lift them, let alone give a demonstration of how beautifully they could sound. Into this sorry state of obsolescence steps our hero, Handel. Now Handel must have known what a trombone was capable of because he wrote three parts for orchestral trombones at the end of his completed score for Israel and Egypt. It looks as if it was a last minute decision as they were written at the end and not included in the general score. It provided quite a lot of gossip and surprise amongst his fans. And we have a letter from the lawyer, um, Thomas Harris, who wrote with astonishment to his brother that they were going to include sackbuts from the time of King David. <laughs> 
The trombone had declined but not died in Germany, and perhaps Handel had heard players from there, which inspired him to write like this. Bach wrote for trombones in some of his cantatas, and his uh, account by his pupil and successor, Johann Gottlieb Doles, about an audition held to fill a Stadtpfeiffer position, says, his performance on the alto trombone of the alto voice of the simple chorale was mediocre. On the other trombones, particularly on the bass trombone, he could not get anywhere, and yet they are inevitably required for the church and the playing of the hours. This gives us an idea of how useful trombones still were in Germany. And we assume that Handel knew slightly better players than this one because he writes beautifully for the trombones. Here's an example of one of the choruses from Israel and Egypt. Handel wrote Saul in the same year, and likewise wrote three parts for trombones, featured in many of the choruses. And he also included a lovely uh, movement of the Dead March, using the sense of the underworld and uh, the gloomy solemnity of the trombones. I'm going to play you the opening phrase of that now. It's a beautiful sound, three trombones in chords playing this funeral march. We don't know who played these parts, but perhaps it was visiting freelance trombonists, probably from Germany, that Handel may have even known personally. They're beautiful and prominent parts, and there's no way that was written for novice players. Apart from this wonderful writing by Handel, there is almost no other mention of trombones in England during the 18th century. In this era of celebrating the individual player and the solo performance, the trombone was not included. With all its knowledge lost about its virtuosity and brilliance, it was relegated to a few exceptional moments. When it came back towards the end of the century, it was seen as exotic, like the fashion for what they called Turkish musicians, um, and they were prized for being unusual. Trombone is listed as appearing at a benefit concert for the famous and wonderful trumpet player Valentine Snow in 1741. And by 1784, there are six players listed in Queen Charlotte's band and Handel commemoration event. So it's beginning to become more prominent. And in 1795, John Woodham applied for membership of the Royal Society of Musicians. And he was the first English born trombonist for more than 100 years. Trumpets and horns, by contrast in this century, rows and rows. Trumpets have their roots in the military, the horns in hunting. There was an interesting development from the horrors of enslavement. Prized for their exotic status, black slaves developed into fine horn players. 
and several had glowing careers, for example, John Handy and Cato, who there's a quote about Cato, who is reckoned to blow the best French horn and trumpet in England. By contrast, the trombone's solemn and old fashioned characteristics that made it favoured instrument for 250 years, sowed the seeds of its downfall. The restoration changed the musical landscape and old fashioned solemnity was out. One of the things that saved the trombone was the thread of excellent playing that continued across Europe, particularly in Vienna. And to end on a positive note, I'm going to conclude with playing an extract from Wagenseil's Trombone Concerto, written in 1763. He composed for the Vienna court, taught the teacher of Beethoven, which was Schenk, and was definitely heard by Mozart. And Mozart, of course, went on to write so beautifully for us in his sacred works and had paved the way for us to climb our way out of the pit of oblivion. His sacred works bring us back into the fold as instruments that can be trusted with a musical line. Thank you very much for listening and joining me on the journey through the trombone's century of decline and I hope that we can continue our journey climbing back into the heart of the most respected composer's imaginations. <laughs>